Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional materials available on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an anonymous chat session allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. All of the efforts of Telema Press, including this lecture, are made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Help us to help humanity by making a donation. Telema Press is a non-profit corporation. Donations are tax-deductible. For more information, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. Now, the heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures. We begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. sign of Leo is represented by a lion. The lion has a universal symbolic significance. We find that The symbol of the lion is ubiquitous, present in every major religion and mythology. Because of its grandeur, its courage, strength, and its beauty. And it appears that we have a particular love or attraction for the great cats. You might even say a kind of fascination. And the lion has always played a very significant and central role in mankind's observations of nature and in the persistent longing to understand how nature functions. Within the context of astrology and the zodiac, Leo, the lion, also has this central role. In fact, we know from studying Gnosis that Leo is the heart of the zodiac. Leo is the sun of the zodiac. Just as our physical sun gives life, provides the basis for existence to all the planets, to all the life forms that exist in this terrestrial environment and in the environments of each of the planets. So too does Leo radiate its effulgent life to all the signs on the physical level, on the energetic level, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, on every level. Leo is like the sun of the mind or the heart or the soul.
That's why astrologists always say Leo is in the house of the sun. Of course, each astrological sign is related to a planet, related to different um, stellar influences and stellar relationships. But the sun, of course, being the center of our solar system, that axle upon which all of life rotates. Leo carries on that level of influence within our own psyche. So we see in the symbolism of the lion this beautiful animal who's well-known and well-regarded for his courage, for his strength. Leo, as an astrological sign, also transmits strength, force, power. This is obviously represented in the Arcanum 11 of the sacred book of the Kabbalistic Tarot. And as you recall from a recent lecture, Canon 11 depicts a beautiful woman who very serenely grasps the mouth of a lion with her hands. Of course, this woman is our own inner divine mother. God. She is the one who has the capacity to properly manage the tremendous energy of the lion, of Leo. As an astrological influence, the sign of Leo is a a channel or a vehicle through which a great deal of energy is transmitted. Those forces descend along the pathways of the ray of creation as it descends down this tree of life. And when those energies are modified through the vehicle of Leo this particular astrological influence. They're impregnated or instilled with these very strong, very powerful energetic forces related to courage, strength, honor. But unfortunately when any given creature has a mind that is trapped in pride, in anger, in fear, those values of Leo flip. They become filtered in the same way that light is changed in its course when it passes through a prism. That light becomes sanguinary, inferior, inverted. And so those qualities of Leo also become inverted. They become negative and harmful. And it's true of any sign, any influence, which we've been discussing. But in particular... These forces of Leo cause, or, as, or rather, um, are harnessed by the desires of our own mind, by the desires of our own heart, and thereby become very dangerous. This influence, this um, situation, is not unique 
to just those persons born under the sign of Leo. This is a situation that everyone who's incarnated in a physical body is experiencing. The unique capacity of Leo is to have great courage, great strength, to have bravery, to be able to take a stand, to fight. But unfortunately, when those energies, those capacities are harnessed, by the subjective nature of our mind, then we will fight for the wrong things. We will have courage in the wrong way. Courage through pride. Courage through anger. This is uh, illustrated very beautifully by the Master Jesus. If you read in Matthew, chapter 15, verse 18, and believe me, those numbers are significant, as you know from studying Kabbalistic numerology. In Matthew 15, 18, Jesus says that it is what comes out of the mouth of a man from his heart that defiles him. You may have heard about this before, that he's saying, it's not what you eat, it's not what you take into your mouth that makes you impure, it's what comes out of it. But if you read that passage carefully, he's saying, what comes through your mouth from your heart. Now what's important about this is that Leo governs the heart. So when those stellar influences, the influence of Leo, is there irradiating our own heart, it's providing an influence, it's providing energy, fuel, forces, which are harnessed by our will. And in that passage in the Gospel, Master Jesus is clearly saying that we have to manage consciously the outpouring of our own heart. And this is related directly to the influence of Leo. As I mentioned, the sun is the heart of our solar system. But our own heart is the sun of our organism. Our whole physiology, our whole psychology, rotates around our heart. The heart itself is a beautiful organ. And it can create a great deal of astonishment when you study the heart. Of course, biologically speaking, we know that the heart is more or less the size of your fist somewhat similar to the shape of a pear. And it rests inside the cavity of the chest, between the lungs. But the heart is a beautiful and very sophisticated device. As a part of our studies of esoteric physiology, we know that the heart is related to fire. And this is easy to understand when you understand something about emotion. That emotion is a very energetic force whose manifestations can have the qualities or attributes of fire. There can be great warmth, blazing heat, and even very cold, or the opposite of fire, related to emotions. So if we understand that the heart is related to fire, 
We also know quite clearly that the lungs are related to air. And here, in just in the physiological level of our body, physical body, we see this fascinating and vital interrelationship of the heart and lungs between fire and air. If you've studied anything about the mechanism of the heart, you know that the heart is a double pump, which is constantly pulsing and pushing blood in two different directions at the same time. It's a heart, it is a vessel with, with um, chambers that receive and transmit and manage the flow of blood in our organism. The blood that the heart receives comes from all of the vessels of the veins throughout the body. And that blood is filled with waste material released by all the cells and living organisms in the body. The blood passes through the heart, this impure blood. And all of those toxins are transmitted through the lungs. And as the blood passes through the capillaries within the lungs, the toxic materials are released into the lungs, which we exhale. And then we breathe in. And the air is received by the lungs again. And that pure oxygen, all the gases and elements that we breathe in, are received by the blood and taken directly back to the heart, which receives all those positive forces and then transmits them throughout the body. So we see this beautiful cycle, how the heart receives all of the impure wastes, cycles them through the heart, and expels them, or through the lungs, rather, and expels those impurities, and then receives pure pure elements and transmits them through the body once again. This great, beautiful cycle. So here we see the constant pulse of life, a giving and taking, projection and reception, a great interrelationship between fire and air. Esoterically speaking, this is the very basis, the very heart of initiation, of the development of the soul. When you examine this functionalism of the heart and lungs, there are subtle and important elements related to our own psychological development that we need to understand. The heart receives all the impurities and purifies them. In the same manner, our own esoteric heart, spiritual heart, has the capacity to receive and purify all those impure elements that we have within. Esoterically speaking, that heart influence is called the Adam Noose. And not because it is actually an atom physically, but because it is a a level of intelligence or a kind of influence, which is quite small, that works on a very subtle level, an atomic sort of level. The Adam Noose is the exponent of the Christ. It is the exponent of the master architect who built the body that you have and who can construct the soul. This vital intelligence already manages 
all of the marvelous functionalisms that you can observe in your physical body. The processes of digestion, breathing, growth, all of the life forms throughout all the organisms that live within us. The cells, the organs, the atoms. All of them are guided by the atom noose. But this atom noose has as its ultimate job to fully develop the human being. We are just an embryo of a human being. Jesus is a real human being. Buddha. An angel is at the beginning of being a human being. And an angel has many steps to go to become absolutely perfect. The Adam Noose is the intelligence which builds that temple of the soul. Leo is the channel through which that influence is propagated within, physically, energetically, psychologically. The the elements of fire and air are, of course, related to tattvas, which are more subtle vibrations of these elements. In Sanskrit, fire is called tehas, and air is called vayu. Tattvas are the more subtle level of any given element. So when we have fire physically, that fire arises because in a more subtle dimension, there is tehas, which is this root energy. But tehas itself is derived from even more subtle forces. Next is ether, and then there's prana. Prana is raw energy, the raw force of life. And everything that exists is really just a modification of prana. Prana, which descends, which coagulates, which condenses, and becomes ether, which condenses further, and becomes the tattvas, related in turn to the four elements. Prana comes into being, comes into existence through our heart. This is why when you study yoga, there's a lot of discussion of prana, energy. And one of the most common practices that is taught in any system of Hindu yoga is prana yama. And of course, this is a compound word. Prana, we've explained, is root energy, life. The Sanskrit term yama has a couple of different subtle meanings. Firstly, it can mean um, to use, to grasp. But in a deeper way, it means to do. Action. So you find in the word yama this very potent, projective, active force, which obviously relates closely to Leo. So the term pranayama is usually translated as to harness the winds, to grasp the winds, to grasp energy, to work with energy. By the term wind is meant the forces of prana. But the way it's taught in the exoteric level is that that wind is the air in your lungs. And so the technique of pranayama is breathing practice. And there are many versions. But in all of them in their essence have the same core 
intention to breathe consciously, to learn to consciously manage your breath. Now, as you observe yourself, you'll discover that by the time you become an adult, your breathing has become very shallow, very much in the upper portion of the lungs. And part of this is due to tension. And that tension is because we're distracted by all the different manifestations in our own mind and by the representations we receive in our psyche and the impressions from life. So part of the original goal of the teacher of yoga in teaching pranayama was to guide the the naive initiate student, the beginner student, to start learning how to be conscious from moment to moment. And so these students would learn pranayama. They would sit for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and breathe consciously. And the purpose of this, although simple, has far-reaching consequences. When we are conscious, meaning we're fully aware of ourselves, we are saving energy we are starting to work directly with the consciousness, which is the basis of the path anyway. The whole point of Gnosis in any religion is to awaken consciousness, not to just gather theories. So in learning to breathe consciously, the student starts to learn how to be conscious. And this is also related closely to a practice in the Buddhist tradition, which is also practiced in the Hindu traditions, called Anapana. And Anapana is simply a practice of learning how to be mindful of your breath all the time, to be watching the breath. We obviously need to breathe to remain alive. But we do it mechanically. Most of the time we aren't even aware of the process of breathing. And so we just go about our business, not fully aware and cognizant that the breath is what keeps us alive. So by becoming conscious of that, by learning to maintain an awareness of the process of breathing, we start to become more conscious of ourselves and to work with the force of the consciousness. Now, in relation to the breath, this is very important. Because when you're breathing, you're drawing in prana. Remember, all the air that's drawn in is then absorbed into the blood, which is cycled throughout the body to feed your organism, to feed this physical body and to sustain it. So if you breathe consciously, you start to breathe in better elements, more pure you start to have bring in the influence of the consciousness. And the consciousness is a direct extension of God. So learning to be conscious of breath can begin a very incipient level of self-awareness. To harness the winds, however, is in reality far more subtle. The winds, in the context of pranayama, is really allegorical. And wind, in, uh, in Asian medicine, is a symbol of energy. So, really, to harness Prana means to learn how to consciously take control of the energies within. All the energies. So the beginning yoga student will begin with the breath. But traditionally, 
Little by little, that student is introduced into more and more subtle forms of energy, learning how to manage them. We see this beautifully represented in a practice that Samael and Vior teaches in relation to Leo. And this is a practice of meditation. This practice is very beautiful and simple. You lie down and relax. You can either lie straight with your arms and legs close together, or you can lie in the form of a star. You relax, close your eyes, and begin to concentrate on the pulse, on the movement of the blood through your body. Now, believe it or not, you actually can sense that and feel that. This practice teaches how to move from point to point through the body, working with the tips of the fingers, the tips of the toes, the tip of your nose, to become very attuned to feeling the movement of the pulse, the cycle of the pulse. Little by little, the yogi who does this practice comes to the astonishing realization that you can control it. It's possible to consciously control your pulse. And this has been scientifically demonstrated many times. A a yogi or a meditator can consciously slow down the pulse can even stop the pulse. Why is this important? This is not just a carnival act. It's important because in the very nature of the pulse, we find important elements related to the consciousness. But what you specifically observe is that the, the experience of samadhi occurs when the pulse is very slow. And samadhi is ecstasy. Samadhi is the experience that the consciousness has when it is free of the ego. In other words, bliss. The consciousness is able to escape the, the cage of the ego, of suffering and experience the truth, reality, without conditioning. So meditators who sit and meditate, trying to develop the skill to enter samadhi, can take advantage of this powerful tool to learn how to work with the heart, the heartbeat, the pulse. Samadhi is important because it's in samadhi that we reach comprehension. Meditation is very widely discussed these days, but very poorly understood. It's very sad to see how the Western mind has formed its concept about meditation. When you investigate this contemporary understanding, you often see images of people sitting in a posture with their crossed legs, with their hands on their knees, with the the hands upturned, and they look very stiff and very uncomfortable. And they have their eyes closed with this sort of fake ecstasy on their expression. This really has nothing to do with meditation. To meditate is to extract the consciousness from the ego. What that means is that 
the entire sense of self that we have has to be abandoned. The I, in other words, has to be abandoned. This takes courage. This takes a lot of strength. That's why Leo is so important. The Master Samael and Vior emphasized repeatedly during the sign of Leo, during the period of time that Leo is so strong, meditate. Take advantage of those forces, of those energies. Because it takes tremendous strength and courage to abandon the cage of the I. In the Gnostic tradition, we have truly a plethora of meditation techniques. Hundreds of techniques. So it's very easy for the student to become confused and to know what to practice. It's important to understand meditation very clearly. Gnosis itself is the science of meditation. When we begin to study Gnosis, we study it intellectually to get a grasp of its idea, of its theme. Little by little, we may start to feel an emotional connection to start to feel the truth of it in our heart. And if we take that seriously, we may begin to practice, to work with it on the third brain. So we have the intellect, the heart, and then the third brain, the motor, instinctive, sexual brain. Which in that case, we would need to start doing it, to try it, to experiment, to teach ourselves, to learn. In the same way that when you are a child and you first see someone riding a bicycle, that idea is so shocking to the child. How are they riding a bicycle? It doesn't make any sense when you see it. But then that emotional urge comes. I want to learn that. I want to know what that feels like. That longing is there. But if we don't act on it, we will never understand. And it will always remain a mystery. So then we have to practice. We have to get a bicycle or borrow one and start trying to ride it. It's very difficult. It's actually really scary, if you remember, if you had that experience. It's terrifying. And we fall down. And we get hurt. Some abandon it. Some give up. So they never have that experience. And the rest of their life, they always have this little bitterness that they gave up and didn't learn. But for those of us who persisted, we learned something quite enjoyable. And once you learn it, it becomes easy. It becomes natural. It becomes something that you can do without thinking about how to do it. If you've learned how to ride a bicycle, then you know what I'm talking about. You no longer have to think about how to do it. You get on the bike and you ride. Free. There's no need to think. There's no need to analyze. There's no need to doubt or question. You simply perform the action. Meditation is exactly the same. Meditation is actually a natural function of the consciousness. It's part of who we are. But unfortunately, because we've made so many mistakes, become so fascinated with desires, with sensations, that we have forgotten how. So in Gnosis, we learn many techniques. There is a sort of desire that arises to just make it simpler to have one technique and have everybody do the same one. And you see that in certain schools and movements 
where they focus exclusively on a single technique and demand that that is the way. Unfortunately, that approach isn't really valid. And we can understand why when you also look back to childhood and you observe how you grew up and what you ate. When you're a child, you're born with certain values physically into a, in a, into a particular environment and with particular needs. And you're given food that's appropriate to your age and your needs. And if you're given the right food, then you grow. The consciousness is the same. In us, the consciousness is a baby. And it needs certain kinds of food. So in Gnosis, in fact, in many traditions, you find a variety of practices for that baby. There's nothing wrong with being a baby. There's nothing wrong with doing practices that are appropriate to your level of development. But it's also important to grow. So the practice that I described a moment ago of observing the pulse is a practice appropriate for a beginner. A practice in which you can teach your consciousness how it works, how it can develop. Anapana, this practice of observing the breath, also qualifies as a good practice for a beginner, for someone who wants to learn how to be aware, how to be conscious, how to concentrate. The many ways that we look at meditation can also um, cause a little confusion. But we can say in synthesis that there are three levels of meditation. The first is perfect concentration. To develop perfect concentration requires practice. This is not something that is going to arise on its own. It requires training. So as I've mentioned previously, there are practices that we can utilize in order to develop concentration. The observation of the breath is one. To work with the pulse is another. In many traditions, you see practitioners working with beads, japa, where they repeat a mantra. This is true in most religions. They repeat a sacred phrase over and over. Really, the intention of that is to develop concentration, not just to do something mechanically. To really develop concentration properly, you have to be conscious of what you're doing, to be aware. If you're doing it mechanically, you're not doing anything good. You're not really growing. So the first level of meditation in this particular scale we're going to look at today is perfect concentration. In the Buddhist tradition, there's a teaching given by Buddha Maitreya called the Nine Levels of Shamatha. In Tibetan, it's called Shine. And these nine levels really describe grades of concentration, degrees or levels Nine is the highest. It's shamatha. In other words, in Sanskrit, it's called pratyahara. This level of concentration is what we know of as one-pointed mind. And what that means is that someone who's acquired or developed that skill can place their mind on any given thing and not be distracted by anything to have a silent mind and have the attention perfectly focused on one thing. Now you can test yourself and find out what degree, what level of concentration you have. A simple way is to say, 
How many times have you lost the train of my lecture today? How many times have you been distracted? How long are you able to remain focused and concentrated? How often does your mind take you into associative thinking? Someone who's developed some concentration is able to keep themselves focused for longer. This is actually a huge problem in society. Everyone's heard of ADD and disorders related to that. It's called attention deficient disorder. Most of the time, it's diagnosed in children. But the fact is, everyone suffers from ADD. Did you know that there is a recent scientific study examining attention in adults? Can you guess the average attention span of the modern adult? Seven seconds. That's it. And that's average. Some are worse. It's easy to see. People who are very distracted, constantly shifting from one thing to another with no continuity. This is a deep form of psychological sleep. And this is the cause of suffering. Someone who has that level of concentration is constantly being tossed about by the storm of their own mind. And they suffer intensely with no real willpower, no staying power. One of the qualities of Leo is the ability to stand firm. Imagine that lion who's able to stay focused and not give up. This is a quality of the consciousness that we need So we perform practices. We repeat mantras. We observe the breath. We learn to visualize. There's a variety of techniques. But what's important to understand is there is no one right technique. There are hundreds and hundreds of techniques. And each one is appropriate in its way at its time. Some students will benefit more from observing the breath. Others will benefit more from meditating, concentrating on a mantra. Others will grow more by learning to concentrate and visualize an image. Some need to sit with the eyes open and observe an image of a sacred object or sacred being. Everyone has a different need. Moreover, those needs change, especially as the consciousness is growing. In the beginning, the consciousness, like a baby, needs simple food, easy to digest. But as it gathers more development, it needs more sophisticated food, more more rich, with more values, with more content, more depth. This is why in Gnosis we have so many techniques, because everyone has a different need according to their level. However, whatever practices we do, whatever techniques we're drawn towards, to proceed To go ahead requires concentration first. Meditation is impossible if you cannot concentrate. You have to be able to concentrate first, to some degree. If you're familiar with the levels of shamatha as taught by Maitreya, then you could see that you'd need to be somewhere in those middle levels, three to five, in terms of a degree of concentration, to really start to understand what meditation is. The next level, number two, is perfect meditation.
So concentration practice, we call it meditation, but it's not. It's concentration. To meditate is to have the ability to observe something without distraction and to understand it. To get information. Really, the one who meditates, meditates to gather information. So a concentration practice doesn't do that. When you learn to concentrate, you're learning to place the attention on something and make it consistent, to hold it there. But when you start to really meditate, you start to observe something, but learn to extract, learn to receive information, understanding. To do that means you have to have the ability to maintain that observation, to maintain that attention continually without distraction. If you're constantly distracted, how can you be there long enough for the information to come? And even if it does, how will you know how to understand it if you can't yet differentiate between all the distractions in your mind? So perfect meditation is that level in which In Sanskrit, it's called, there's two two different aspects, dharana and dhyana. And these are levels within which you're able to observe something with one pointed concentration and get something back. But there's another level. The third level is perfect samadhi. Samadhi is another word that's, that's often misunderstood. But in, its, in the varying interpretations that are given to the term, really the synthesis of them is ecstasy. Or what we would call nirvana. Not as a place, but as a state of consciousness. The Tibetan word for samadhi, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce, means to hold unwaveringly so there's no movement. Now, obviously, that requires concentration. To be able to fix something in your mind without having any movement whatsoever. The mind is still, like a lake. But that meaning is only describing the door. Samadhi is actually a doorway. There are many kinds of samadhis, many levels. And all those levels are related to this tree of life. In other words, the Kabbalah. Many forms of samadhi and many levels of consciousness. But in their essence, they all have the same essential quality. Freedom from the ego. So to synthesize, we learn to meditate, to concentrate our consciousness perfectly and extract it from the mind. There are a lot of techniques that help us do that. Many. And when that extraction happens, the consciousness escapes from its prison, our own mind, our karma, our ego. And in that escape, it experiences what is called nirvana, ecstasy, or a beautiful experience. It may be a vision. It may be any number of different qualities can arise. Different experiences can arise. The beauty is Anyone can have this experience. It's natural to the mind. But it cannot be forced. You cannot force it. It arises naturally on its own. Now, this is a little bit of a contradiction to the intellect. 
Because you have to make effort, but you cannot exert. You have to do the practice, but you, and you have to be active consciously, but your mind has to be passive. Your personality has to be passive. So there is a very delicate psychological balance that you have to achieve. When you've developed a certain level of concentration and you relax and you're trying to do your practice, you can pass through these three levels in the course of an instant. Don't understand these three levels as great plateaus that are going to extend over the course of your life. That in a few years you'll have established yourself in perfect meditation and then a few years more in perfect samadhi. It doesn't work like that. You can experience these today in one practice. If you apply yourself consciously in the right way. No one can really teach you how to do it. You have to teach yourself. You can sit to meditate and work with a mantra and have a very dispersed mind, very chaotic. But if the elements are in the right place, you may suddenly realize that the mind has has become quiet and then you're able to concentrate very well. And then suddenly you, you have some kind of an experience some kind of understanding arises. And then it goes away just as fast as it arises. And once again, the mind is crazy. How did that happen? There are two factors. The first is that you're practicing. Samadhi can never arise if you don't practice. In the same way, if you don't eat, your body will die. Meditation is a kind of food. It's food for the consciousness. It feeds the soul. Meditation is facilitated through our practice of it. But it is empowered by the Adam Noose through Leo. When you do your practice, you relax, you concentrate. The Adam Noose, that intelligence related to the Christ, is able to provide guidance, to provide assistance, to help you. But only if you do the work. If you don't practice, then you will have no benefit. These, uh, all these different ways of looking at meditation. Because we have this one, these three levels, concentration, meditation, and samadhi. We also look at it sometimes from the point of view of yoga, which can break it into five or seven levels, or even more, depending on which particular tradition it's coming from. You can also look at it from the point of view of Christian traditions or Buddhist traditions, all of which break down and analyze meditation in different ways. They are all equally true. You could say it's very much like standing outside of a building. And there are a lot of windows into the building. And you're a student walking around the outside. Right now, you're looking in through one particular window, which I'm showing you. And from this window, and you look in, you see a laboratory. And that laboratory, from your point of view, has different items arranged in a particular order. And I'm explaining to you about that. But you can go and read a book or listen to another lecture, and the point of view will be different. It might even sound contradictory. And in fact, you could start to have a conversation with someone about meditation And they can say, no, 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 no. It's not like that. This is before this and this is before that. What are you talking about? But what you need to realize is they may be on the other side of the building looking in at the same thing from another point of view. 
The science is the same. And the one who's entered the room, that is, the one who practices, who goes into that room and begins to work with the tools that are there, will understand how the tools work together. But that understanding comes by experimenting. If you just look at the tools, if you pick them up sometimes and say, oh, this is interesting, and you put it back down, you won't understand it. You have to work with them, with patience. Work with the tools. Work with the techniques. The books of Samael and Vior are packed with techniques. Believe me, you will never be able to try them all. There's too many. But start. Pick one and work with it. Not just for a day. Give it some time. Give yourself an opportunity to really experiment within yourself the different techniques. They all work. Every one of them works. But you'll find that certain ones vibrate more with you. You relate more to it. Somehow, it feels right. It tastes good. And that's why there's so many techniques. But do go into the room, this room filled with tools, and begin to work with them. And you'll start to see how all of these apparently complicated and very sophisticated ways of looking at meditation are actually quite simple. The same is true of prayer. To pray is to converse with God. Leo, in the house of the sun, rules the heart. And the heart is developed through prayer and meditation. Prayer and meditation provide the food that the heart needs in order for it to grow. When you study any type of religion, the quality of the heart is always emphasized. Usually, the quality of the mind is as well. And that's because these two are really one. That's why we see such an important relationship between fire and air. Fire related to the heart, air is related to the lungs, but it's also related to the mind. We learn to meditate in order to understand the mind and to change it. We pray in order to develop the heart, to awaken the heart, to open the heart. In Buddhism, there's a term called bodhicitta. This also is a compound word. Usually it's translated as compassion. But the components are important. Bodhi means wisdom. Citta means mind or intellect. In the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, bodhicitta is the central focus, which is the development of compassion. In fact, the most popular deity in the Mahayana tradition is the goddess, Tara. Tara is here. Tara is said to have two primary aspects which are represented by her feet, her legs, which she stands on. They are wisdom and compassion. Wisdom is related to the mind, compassion to the heart. What's very interesting is if you read in the books of the Master Samael and Vior, he states that the blue hierarchies of the sun are what give rise to life, what provide life. Blue, 
as a color. The, the master Lita Lantes, who was the wife of Samael and Weor, stated that clairvoyantly, when you observe the colors of a person, if you see someone who has a lot of blue, it's because they have a lot of love. So blue is closely related with the heart. And when the Master Samael states that the blue hierarchies of the sun give rise to life, he's talking about compassion, the force of love, which of course is the Christ itself. Christ is the light of the world, the sun, the son of God, that force around which all life spins. That love, that force of compassion is characterized as blue. Which is one aspect of the Divine Mother in in terms of Tara. The other side is wisdom. Litalantes further said that if you see someone who has a lot of yellow, that's wisdom. Yellow is related to the mind. So you see bodhicitta, wisdom mind, which they translate as compassion. What you're really seeing there is the unification of heart and mind. And they state in Mahayana Buddhism that self-realization is based upon two factors, wisdom and compassion. Wisdom, having an awakened mind, Compassion, having an awakened heart. Prayer is a practice we use to awaken the heart. You may have also heard this phrase that we need to learn how to think with the heart and feel with the head. And this is an essential description of how to to acquire an equilibrium between the heart and mind. This is made possible by the intelligence of the Adam Nuth. If we meditate and we learn what prayer is. The Master Samael indicated many times that prayer and meditation need to be unified. Need to become one. But we have to understand what prayer means in this case. He also says that to properly pray that famous prayer of the Lord, our Father who art in heaven, it's very short, just a few lines, but it actually takes an hour to pray that properly because one has to combine it with meditation. To pray that consciously, slowly, in silence. The silence of the mind and the silence of the heart. With devotion. In this way, we start to understand that through prayer and meditation... Obviously, we're trying to develop the consciousness, to awaken the consciousness. What we need to really grasp is that the consciousness can be awakened in two ways. In purity or in impurity. In other words, within the ego or outside the ego. There are many schools that teach how to meditate, how to pray, how to do practices about the chakras, about Kabbalah, about all the different bodies that we have, about God, about truth, about love. But they don't teach 
how to awaken the consciousness out of the ego. So there are many students who are learning how to work with the consciousness, but within pride, within lust. To awaken the consciousness free of the ego, we need the being. If we ignore our own inner being, we're trying to do these types of practices on our own. We can make a grave mistake. Gnosis teaches us that we have approximately 3% free consciousness. We know of this as the conscience. That little voice that you hear sometimes that tells you, don't do that. Usually we ignore it. Usually we listen to the desires of the mind. Oh, I'll do it anyway. Who cares? Nobody's going to find out. Nobody knows. I can get away with it. I'm going to do it because I really want to. It's very subtle. To awaken the consciousness free of ego means that we have to extract the consciousness from desire. Desire is a cage. Desire is a prison. Every desire we feed we further encage ourselves to suffering. This is the basis of every religion. The Bible says, he who commits sin is a slave of sin. The Upanishads say, desires are fetters for the mind. Buddhists say, he who conquers desire realizes the deathless state. To conquer desire is to conquer one's own self, the false self, the ego. This cannot be done with the ego itself. A problem cannot solve a problem. The only way to be saved, to be redeemed, to find freedom is with the help of God, the help of your own being, That's why prayer is so important. To begin to develop that relationship. Nowadays, most people have no experience of God. That's why there are so many who say that God does not exist. It's simply because they don't have that experience. And we can't blame them for that. Being trapped inside the sensual mind and only trusting experience of the senses, how could they experience that which is beyond the senses? This is why meditation is important. Through meditation, we activate the consciousness, which can experience that which is beyond the senses. Through prayer, we activate the heart, which creates that channel. A prayer does not have to be anything complicated. When you were a child and you needed something from your mother, you spoke in plain language. You can appeal to your own inner God in the same way. From the purity of your own heart, crying out, from within your suffering, from within your fear, your doubt, your despair. You may have forgotten your God. You may not know him. You may not know your divine mother. But they have never forgotten you. Your own being is with you. Always. Inside. Watching. 
That's why he is called the divine witness. Because he is always there. Unfortunately, there is another man there. The being we, we find in the Gospels, in the Bible rather, in the New Testament, Paul describes the being as the heavenly man. who's within us. There's another man in us who's the animal man. The I. And these two are in constant conflict. Unfortunately, we think, we feel, we believe That the animal man is our real self. We think, we feel, we believe that our thoughts and our feelings are real. We have forgotten how to listen to the being, how to listen to the terrestrial or to the heavenly man how to recognize this animal man, the terrestrial man, for what he is. Prayer can be based in uh, conscious prayers, objective prayers, like the prayer of the Lord. There are many like that. There are many mantras, many prayers. The Apostles' Creed, the prayer to the Divine Mother. These are all objective prayers. They're all powerful. They have good qualities that can help us. But the simple prayer of the heart also has power. The prayer of a child can change the world. Did you know that the human heart is the most sensitive organism that exists. The human heart that you have inside your body is so sensitive that it can register seismic movements on the other side of the planet. And yet, we ignore it. We have no real knowledge of the powers and the mysteries that are in our own heart. And yet, this heart is the doorway to God, to the being. The development of meditation to have the experience of God arises when the heart and mind are balanced and the ego is not there. The heart is a temple And within that temple is our own Divine Mother. There is a meditation practice to visualize that, to imagine that. To allow our imagination to guide us into that temple to receive guidance, to receive help. And any one of us can do that. The heart temple of the human organism is the domain of our own Divine Mother. What proceeds out of that heart is what defiles us. Our lust, our passion, our greed, our gluttony, our fear, our resentment, our self-hate, despair, feeling rejected, feeling forgotten, envy, jealousy. These all poison our heart. And when that flows out from our heart, it poisons our actions. 
The result is karma. Terrible suffering. Yet the Divine Mother is there. If we pray, if we meditate, if we learn how to work with the energies that we have within, we can give her the strength of the Arcana 11, the Arcana 11, to control those forces of the lion. To dominate the heart temple and to make it a sacred place. In that way, we can start to comprehend the nature of God. In relation to Leo, Samuel and Vior wrote that there are three forces that descend from above. And these three we see here in this top triangle in the Tree of Life. These are the three Akashic breaths. Three energies which are one, which descend into us as a form of energy and vitality. Unfortunately, we waste it because in our heart we're identified with lust, with greed, with jealousy. So those energies continue to flow downwards and are wasted in our wrong actions, in our wrong feelings, and in our wrong thoughts. You see those three forces related to the three brains, related to our three nervous systems. But unfortunately, we waste them. Yet, if we learn how to take control of ourselves consciously, to observe ourselves, to begin to control the outpouring of our heart and mind, to take responsibility, and to try to change. We can change that process. We can start to get the strength to control the lion. The root of that is in commanding our energies. And of course, we know that the sexual energies are the most potent and powerful energies that are in, within us. And when we control those forces with the help of God, those energies can be harnessed to create the soul. To fortify the consciousness. To give strength of the lion to our own soul. Rather than giving strength to our lust, to our anger, to our pride, we can utilize those forces to give strength to our Divine Mother. The science to harness those forces in one particular tradition of Tantrism in India and in Tibet is called Dumo. This word Dumo literally means she who terrifies egotistic forces. Dumo yoga is, is known as heat yoga, where a yogi can transmute his sexual forces and irradiate heat. So you may have heard stories of yogis sitting up in the mountains in the Himalaya melting snow because they could generate so much heat. That's sexual fire that they harness, they save, and they're able to work with consciously through pranayama. But that energy itself is the Divine Mother. She who terrifies the ego. She is Tara, the goddess. When we learn to transform those forces, to yoke the prana, and we transmute those energies, we can awaken the kundalini, which rises up the spinal column. Leo commands the spinal column and the heart. It takes the ferocious courage of the lion to raise the kundalini. 
And the kundalini awakens based on the merits of the heart. There is no trick. There is no secret technique. There is no amount of money that you can pay to raise the kundalini. Because the kundalini, the dumo, is the divine mother itself. It is God. It is that intelligence, the fire of God, that Holy Spirit, which guided the Israelites in the desert. You you cannot trick God, and you can't pay for God with money. You can only perform the commands of God and receive his blessings. The kundalini raises up the spinal column little by little in accordance with the development of our heart based in chastity and transmutation. It will only awaken if the energy is being saved, if those forces are being gathered in that church and as a blessing from God. This is a very deep and extensive science. But in synthesis, we can say, working with the forces of Leo in relation to the heart and the sex, we purify the mind. The Divine Mother, Kundalini, is the very energy, the very force that we take and harness in order to destroy the cage of the ego. This is why we see images of Durga or Kali with that spear and her sword slaying the demon. The demon is our own mind. She rides what? A great cat. Leo. Of course, her husband is Shiva, who also wears the skin of the cat and has wrapped around him a serpent, which is the kundalini itself. And oftentimes you see a flow of amrita projected out of the top of his head. That is transmuted sexual energy made pure. When we do that, when we harness those energies and forces, we really are working with another triangle. In the earth, which is ourselves. So when the Master Samael writes, there are three forces that descend from above and three that rise up from the earth. It took me all that time to explain that. Those two triangles meet in the heart and form the seal of Solomon. And of course, that seal, the six-pointed star, is those two triangles united, which has a deep significance, in many levels, many meanings. And this is one. That unity of the two triangles in the heart is equivalent to perfection as a soul, <laughs> to become a mahatma, a great soul, is to have that. But that doesn't come simply because you do a practice a lot or you do a certain mantra a hundred thousand times or a million times. It has nothing to do with that. It comes from purity of heart and mind. The awakening of consciousness, the awakening of the kundalini, the awakening of the powers of the consciousness are all gifts from God. God does not grant these gifts to murderers, adulterers, thieves, and liars. And we are all of that. Every religion states the same. Jesus in the Bible states it very clearly. To enter heaven, you have to be perfect like God is. Krishna says it. Buddha says it. Muhammad says it. Paul says it in the, in the later books of the Bible. No idolaters, no fornicators, no murderers can enter heaven. Period. Well, that sounds pretty bleak. 
So who gets to go? Because we've all done those crimes. Maybe not in this life, but probably in the last one, or the one before that. And if you sincerely observe the contents of your heart and mind, and you see you have thoughts of violence, you feel the urge to violence, then you have the potential to kill. If you have the urge or the thought or the desire to commit adultery, you can do it physically too. But doing it physically is only one level of the crime. Also in the Gospels, Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. Which means all of us are adulterers. Which is very sad. Because those forms of crime are crimes not only against the other person, and crimes against ourselves. They're crimes against our own God, our own being. It's better to learn how to behave properly with respect for ourselves and for others. To learn to take control of the energies that are rising in us constantly and to use those for good things. For example... You have to teach yourself how to look at other people, how to relate to them. Your mind looks at other people in relation to its conditioning. Fearfully, we are afraid of people. Or lustfully, we look always measuring people against our own lust, our own taste. Oh, they don't have this and that. Oh, they rank really high on my list. Constantly measuring. This is the animal mind. And this is a waste of energies and produces suffering. But if instead we can learn to look at people and remember God, when we see a woman, if we are a man and we see a woman, to look at her and see our own Divine Mother and remember our own Divine Mother, you can do it. If you have a mother physically, you can look at her that way. You don't have to look at your own mother with lust, although you might, because the mind has that. You can look at your own sister and appreciate her good character, her good qualities. Why can you not look at other women in the same way? And the same applies for how women look at men. We have to teach the consciousness to see in the right way. This is part of the virtue of meditation. When we learn to meditate, I'm talking about beyond mere concentration. The real purpose of meditation is to gather information, to understand. And that understanding is so that we can break the cycle of suffering that we ourselves create. You cannot destroy lust if it remains hidden in yourself. You can't destroy your anger if it remains hidden in yourself. You have to see that. That's why your being, your God, will give you ordeals, problems in life, so that your anger will rise and you can say, oh, look at that. Look how mad I am. And you can understand that suffering. And then later you can meditate and observe it and understand it. But that understanding, this is very important. It is not enough to simply Observe and analyze the defect, the ego of anger in this example. Many students understand very well that they need to meditate and they need to observe the different events where they suffer and they need to look at that defect and understand that anger in this example. But it's necessary to take the next step which is to also look at what you should have done. Not merely what you did wrong, what you felt wrong, what you thought wrong, but what should you have done. And this is where God comes in. 
Your Divine Mother is there to help you understand, to help you dissolve the problems and mistakes that exist in our mind. But your Divine Mother, your being, is also there to give you the understanding of how to develop the virtue in relation to that mistake that you made. Trapped within that anger is love. Did you know that? Trapped within that defect, that psychological block, that mistake that is in your own mind is a virtue. But it's trapped inside of a cage and is acting in the wrong way because of that conditioning. You start to free it when you understand that that quality is a defect. It is karmic and it needs to be changed. But you change further when you understand the right way to act, the right way to behave. You have to comprehend the defect and you have to comprehend the virtue. And these two go hand in hand. In that way, the lotus of the heart will blossom. Because in that way, little by little, as you meditate, as you understand your own experiences, you understand more and more of how to be a good person. How to act in accordance with the guidance of God, the heavenly man within, rather than the animal man, the desires of the mind. And as you learn that, and as your heart grows and gathers the strength of Leo, the Kundalini also is given the right to advance if you're practicing chastity with a spouse. And as a single person, you simply become more and more pure. More and more pure. Whether you're single or in a couple, you can make tremendous strides in this work. So Leo has tremendous importance. Ruling the spine and the heart. It has direct bearing on the development of our own soul. It is the house of the Divine Mother. Do you have any questions? You said that forcing the mind to be silent is not a good practice. Mm-hmm. You, you actually cannot force the mind to be silent. You can try, and some people do. And you may have the impression that the mind is silent, but it isn't. There are certain approaches to meditation which truthfully are actually a form of violence. A form of violence in the mind. Which try to quiet the mind by force of will. And they can produce a certain experience of calm or concentration. But unfortunately, they are based in a desire and based in violence. It's the desire to have a quiet mind. And it's a violence against one's own psyche. And the result is complication. Because in that state, samadhi cannot arise. So the practitioner who's working in that way will be disappointed, will be frustrated, and will have a great conflict, feeling like, well, here I am, I've got some concentration, why am I not having samadhi? And they'll have a big conflict. And it's simply a a mistake of approach, a mistake in attitude. The truth of meditation is arrived at with patience. Let me explain this in a way that I think may help you. In the Master's writings related to Leo, he wrote this line, the Kundalini is the laboratory where the heart works. I think normally students understand this the other way, thinking that the heart works in the laboratory of the, or thinking of the kundalini works in the laboratory of the heart. Think about that. 
the way it actually works. The heart itself works through the kundalini, is what he's saying. The mind works through kundalini. If you persist in developing chastity, in learning transmutation, in learning all the basic practices, you are, in essence, planting a tree. This tree here. But a tree takes time to grow. You cannot rush it. The farmer plants the seeds and just makes sure that the seed is getting the elements it needs to grow. Nowadays, of course, people are not so patient. So now we're planting seeds and, and forcing them to grow faster with chemicals and crossbreeding and all kinds of other things. What's the result? Little monsters. Plants that have no real vitality. Plants that are dead energetically. They may look nice, but they're tasteless. Have you tried any of the tomatoes that you can buy in the store? They have no taste. They're empty because they're crossbred, because they're injected with all kinds of chemicals. They have no real sustenance. They're dead. They look nice, but they have nothing in them. The same is true in developing the consciousness. Meditation is a science that has to be understood in practice and it is developed slowly. Don't rush. Do your practice every day. And inevitably, if you experiment, you have patience, you practice, you don't have expectations, the seed will sprout and grow. Expectations, desires for experiences, impatience will kill it. It's really unfortunate when you see students who have killed their own development in meditation. And sometimes that happens because they're infected with the, the um, what is the word? Ambition of a teacher or another student or a school or something they may already have. Let me tell you, ambition and meditation do not mix. Be very careful with ambition. We all have the longing to develop the soul. We all have the longing to know God. We all have the longing to understand the soul and how meditation works and to have those experiences. The longing is natural. It's part of what's driving us to enter into these studies, and we need that. But don't convert that longing into ambition, into goals. Like, I'm going to reach samadhi within six months, or I'm going to reach this experience within this amount of time. That's a mistake. You're setting yourself up for disappointment. God does not answer to the ego. If you start setting goals like that, <laughs> believe me, God will not play that game with you. He will not give you what you're trying to get from him. You will get what you deserve and nothing more. You will get what you deserve and nothing less. It's the best attitude you can have in relation to meditation is a calm indifference to be serene. To do the practice because you need to do it. You go to the bathroom because you have to. Right? You eat because you have to. You breathe because you have to. In truth, to develop the soul, you have to meditate. We just need to learn how. But we need to learn how in the same way we eat. We eat to sustain ourselves. And we eat the best food we can get in order to develop the best health we can get. But if you have this attitude that you eat for desire, you eat because you want 
to feed gluttony or desire, you may be doing the same thing with meditation. Many people approach meditation with gluttony, with greed, with desire, and it's a mistake. Another question? I think in some traditions, green has connotations related to compassion because we see green Tara. is one manifestation of Tara. But in Gnosis, we generally talk about green in relation to hope. Another question? Prana is a condensation of Akash. Akash is the primordial substance, and prana is its first manifestation. In relation to the sexual energy, sexual energy itself is that energy, but condensed. So when you start working with the sexual energy, you're learning how to harness the forces all the way back to the Akash. You work with it physically to control it, to manage it. Then you start to work with it emotionally and mentally because those same energies are what fuel the heart and mind. When you transmute those forces with the help of God, you're learning to control those energies and those levels. But then you have to go beyond that. Yes? Absolutely. You may or may not have that experience. From time to time, the meditator, the practitioner, can experience a wide variety of sensations. Sometimes you can feel heat. Sometimes other types of sensations. Really, there's an enormous variety. It's neither good nor bad. Don't take sensations as a measure of progress. Don't look for sensations as a guide. They may or may not come. The best thing to do is to remain focused in the practice you're doing, not be distracted. Another question? Anyone? pretty much any book on Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, the nine levels of shamatha are widely taught in Tibetan Buddhism. So there are numerous texts about shamatha meditation or about um, the combination of shamatha and vipassana, which is um, the two forms of meditation that give rise to samadhi. So it's commonly taught. There's also a course on the Gnostic teachings website which breaks down those nine levels. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. See you next week. Welcome to the... Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional materials available on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. 
To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.